Attempts out there to build on the U.S. equity rally. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. We thought it was going to be a quiet week. Yeah, it's a lot going on today. We were wrong. All right, let's get a check in here on where U.S. market uh, action is. So the S&P is up just two-tenths of 1%. Utilities and energy, though, weighing on the S&P. The worst performing stock within the S&P, though, is UPS. Uh, We'll get to that in just a moment. A couple things going on. Uh, J.P. Morgan thinking that their three-year outlook was actually aggressive and are a little worried they're going to have to raise costs in order to meet some of their goals. Uh, And then, of course, on the flip side, one of the best performing stocks today, no uh, no doubt, is DJT. That's a SPAC merger of Digital World Acquisition with Sue's Tr- Truth Social. That is completed. And the five-year worth checking in, going nowhere fast. We did have an auction today. It was tepid demand, but, you know, we're hanging in there at 422, Romain. Yeah, we're going to keep you up to date on all of the market action here on the day, but we're going to spend a lot of time really focusing on that bridge collapse overnight in Baltimore, Maryland. As emergency personnel assess the human toll, and the bureaucrats assess the financial costs, the companies that rely on that Baltimore Marine Terminal and the roads and the rail lines leading to it, they're scrambling right now to find alternative routes. Baltimore is the busiest U.S. seaport for sugar, for farm equipment, and for cars. Ford CFO John Lawler telling Bloomberg earlier he's already looking to divert cargoes to other ports. General Motors releasing a statement saying that it's going to do the same as well. U.S. coal exports, about a fifth of which move through Baltimore, could be halted for at least four to six weeks. That's according to the CEO of trading company X Coal Energy. Console Energy, which operates one of the big coal facilities at that port, saw its stock drop the most this year. Arch Resources down as much as 5%. CSX, which has rail lines servicing the terminal, also selling off, as did energy pipeline company Kinder Morgan. A little bit later, we are going to talk to the UPS CEO, Carol Tomei, as several logistics companies do have facilities at the north end of that bridge. That includes Amazon, FedEx, and Home Depot. And while most economists that Bloomberg has spoken to say the financial impact will be manageable, the ex coal CEO said there is a limit to how much you can actually divert to some of those nearby East Coast ports like Norfolk, Virginia, Alex, as well as New York City. Also, do they have to wait in line to do it? Yeah. Is there just going to be a backlog at the end of the day? Also, the question is, you know, what happens to the vessels that are actually in the no-go zone? So this is a, a, a the B map uh, at Bloomberg here. This is the bridge right here is where the dolly is. Now, it's these blue uh, uh, checks that you need to pay attention to. These are all the vessels that now kind of can't get out. Some of them are tugboats uh, and tug vessels, but other ones are, say, a bitumen tanker, which is heavy oil, a uh, row row cargo, so roll in, roll off, that has to do with cars, general ca- cargo ships, a bulk carrier. And what happens to them is they kind of stay stuck firm as it's going to be so difficult and took, may take years to kind of clean this up, Romain. Yeah, absolutely. We had a chance to hear from the president a little bit earlier. Here's what he had to say. I told them we're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. Everything so far indicates that this was a terrible accident. At this time, we have no other indication, no other reason to believe there's any intentional act here. Let's go out to Baltimore right now where Kaylee Lines, the co-host of Balance of Power, is on the scene there. A press conference from the NTSB just now wrapping up. Kaylee, what do we know? Well, what we just heard from the NTSB chair, Jennifer Hominy, Romaine, was frankly that there is a lot we do not know at this point. She emphasized that right now the priority, really all that is going on is the search and rescue effort. And that is being led by the U.S. Coast Guard. That is still ongoing as we know that there was a construction crew present on the bridge at the time of this collision in collapse. Two people have been rescued, one of which is hospitalized. Six others, though, remain unaccounted for. So really search and effort is what is uh, search and rescue effort, rather, is being what prioritized right now, though she did say they have a team of 24 investigators that are here on scene that will begin working to figure out what went wrong. Of course, while the human impact is first and foremost here for first responders, there are, of course, secondary effects. This is a bridge that had 35,000 people per day, roughly, uh, transiting over it for commuting. Otherwise, of course, 4,900 trucks daily, we understand, according to trucking associations, from the commercial end of this, we're crossing this bridge. All of that now disrupted, having to route uh, to I-95 or other ways around Baltimore. Then, of course, as you've been discussing, there is the cargo impact. This is an incredibly busy port. Nearly 850,000 vehicles were handled by this port 
in 2023. And of course, as, as you've alluded to, auto is not the only industry that risks disruption here, commodities as well. And there just has been no timeline given by authorities at this point as to when the port could reopen or when the bridge potentially could be reconstructed. Governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, when speaking to reporters earlier today, did not put a timeline on things, though he did describe the reconstruction of the bills, uh, bridge as something that would be a long haul project. And of course, we heard from President Biden indicating he would like the federal government to pay for all of that. It's worth keeping in mind, though, that while he says he does think Congress would grant that it does need to be a supplemental funding request through the legislature. And we have seen that these funding requests have had some difficulty getting through this divided Congress uh, in not very uh, distant uh, memory. Of course, we just got funding through this Congress last week. So that could be something to watch moving forward. But right now, it really is a search and rescue effort underway. And this is going to be uh, a saga that is measured not in weeks and months, but potentially years to come. Yeah, exactly. All right, Kaylee, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. A Bloomberg Balance of Power co-host Kaylee Lines. So outside that rescue effort, uh, the bridge collapse is causing big concerns about, about the supply chain. It is the number one port for U.S. auto imports. We spoke earlier to Ford's CFO about that fallout. It's a large port with a lot of uh, flow through it, so it's going to have an impact. It's just at this point, we'll have to understand what that means for us specifically. We'll work on the workarounds. We'll have to divert parts to other ports along the East Coast or elsewhere in the country. And it'll probably lengthen the supply chain a bit. All right, joining us now is Bindi Avakil, co-founder and CEO of supply chain intelligence and analytics firm Razilnik. Literally, no one better to talk to about this. You're running your models, you're crunching the numbers. Uh, what has to be diverted? What's at risk? Thank you for having me. Um, Reslink's data shows there are about 3,200 sites that are involved in various supply chain activities, such as logistics, dist uh, distribution, where, uh, warehousing, and manufacturing in and around 30 miles of this port. And over 7,000 parts and raw materials uh, come from um, this region. Uh, and so this is a pretty important region from that perspective. Now, the port itself is um, transporting uh, it's the largest roll-on, roll-off port, obviously. But in terms of overall volumes, it's about the 13th largest of the container, 13% uh, of the container volume of some of the larger New York, New Jersey type of ports. Not only that, there are other ports around um, on the East Coast that can take some of the capacity, as you've mm -hmm. mentioned. So overall... Mm -hmm. We see that there will be a disruption near term, mm -hmm. but within that three to four weeks, we should start to see this um, really come, uh, become clear how quickly the port itself can recover. Uh, give us a sense here, uh, Bindia, when we talk about diverting these ships to other ports, uh, what is, if at all, the added costs to some of those cargo ships in order to do that? There's cost, there's complexity. Um, you know, some of the larger companies that you talk to obviously have um, large um, uh, contracts, multiple lanes of transportation and modes as well. So if the port can't operate, some of the cargo can go from rail and road. But for some of the smaller companies that are 100% reliant on the port to be functioning and don't have that backup capacity, those are the ones who really struggle when these types of disruptions happen. So to, to that point, even if I'm able to divert where I'm sending my vessel, what's the logistical end on the other side? So maybe I'm waiting in line until my turn. Now that line gets a lot longer. What kind of equipment do I need to have on land in order to offload certain things? You have to have, obviously, there are roll-on, roll-off ports like New York, New Jersey has that capacity as well as the port of Savannah has that capacity. So there are other ports that can handle some of the cargo, but they're not sitting idle, meaning only some of that capacity can be available, which means if you're using those ports today, you may not even be using the Baltimore port, but your ship might get delayed in getting um, cargo offloaded or on uh, or loaded. Uh, That's really the problem. Nine. So, Bindia, can you fold this into some of the broader issues that have been going on? We've been talking a lot, of course, about the disruptions in the Red Sea uh, because of the war over there, uh, the drought uh, that's affecting the Panama Canal. Uh, and now you add in, uh, at least in the U.S., a major port that's effectively going to be kind of hamstrung for potentially months here. What are we looking at in terms of our overall supply chain stability? Are we back to those bad old days from the pandemic? 
You know, it's not as bad as the pandemic. The pandemic really did affect so many countries at such a large scale. And in su- uh, and it was too fast for the supply chain to recover uh, just because we had gone into the pandemic with very low inventory levels. This time around, we have had months, if not years, of companies doing larger inventory buildups to call, call it just-in-case buildups. Now, while we did see some of that rebalance out where companies do, do to large lo- lo- higher interest rates take down some of those inventory levels, we are still not back to 2019. So a lot of that two to four weeks of coverage is there uh, more than what we had going into 2020. All right. Uh, Bindia, always great to catch up with you. Bindia Vakil there. She's the co-founder and CEO over at Resilink. They've actually identified about 4,000 sites right now within a 30-mile radius that are going to be impacted by the collapse of this bridge. We're going to have more insight on the potential knock-on effects of the bridge collapse. We're going to actually have a sit-down with the CEO of UPS, Carol Tomei, going to be joining us in just a minute. All right. Plus, you get U.S. stocks on track for a fifth-month winning streak. Stuart Kaiser, head of equity trading strategy over at Citi, joins us next. And Adobe and Microsoft. Microsoft teaming up to bring new AI capabilities to Microsoft's co-pilot. We're going to go live out to Las Vegas, where the Adobe Summit Conference is taking place. A key CEO, uh, executive, I should say, going to be joining us soon. All that and more coming up in a bit. This is The Close on Bloomberg. days away from wrapping up uh, the first quarter. And if we do well this month, it will be the fifth month in a row that U.S. equities are higher. We haven't seen that kind of winning streak from November to March since 2013. Joining us now, Stuart Kaiser, head of equity trading strategy over at Citi. Stuart, does that give me confidence or does that give me pause? (laughs) I mean, I think he's giving some people pause. They're a little bit worried of the, you know, bubble discussion. I've been worried uh, for how long? <laughs> a bit. A Since bit. Birth. And, and I've been proven wrong every day. Well, okay. they say climbing the wall of worry is, is a good, a good, uh, <laughs> good market outcome. Look, I, we're still pretty constructive. We've been pretty much constructive all year, and I think basically from our perspective, if the if the labor market holds in, remains solid, then you want to continue to run long equity risk. You know, the Fed just took up their nominal growth expectations. They're you know getting ready to cut. It seems like regardless of what goes on, you're looking at something on the order of 8 to 10 percent EPS growth for the S&P 500. So, yeah, we're, we're still pretty positive. We're still comfortable on the equity markets here. You sound like you make this argument a lot. Do you get a lot of skepticism out there? <laughs> uh, I mean, l- less now than there was 12 months ago. But I, it's funny. I've been accused of being bullish. I've never really felt bullish. But, you know, I have been accused. Of, I, there, look, people are still concerned. I think there's still an element of uh, the Fed's going to break something, and that hasn't happened, and, and we need to be concerned about that. And, you know, there are some some glimmers of a little bit of risk on the labor side of the economy, which I think, you know, folks are really, really focused on as well. But look, after 20 percent last year, and we're almost up 10 percent again this year, I think most people are are in the markets might just be doing it in a more cautious way. Uh, what, what what does that end up entailing, though? Is that Does it become sort of a rotation where people then look for, I guess, those stocks have been laggards? Or does this maybe represent an opportunity for that money to flow out of equities into other asset classes? I mean, our view is you, you still want to stay in equities yeah. here. You know, like equities have outperformed bonds significantly in the first quarter. But yeah. historically, when that happens, equities tend to outperform the yeah. next quarter as well. So, you know, we're not we're not necessarily running for the hills from that perspective. I think, you know, we do believe in the broadening out of performance in the equity market. Um, it's happening in a very slow and steady fashion, I right. guess I would say. You know, you've got those MAG-7 were about two-thirds of market mm-hmm. cap gains last year. This year, they're at about 40%. Mm-hmm. So they're driving less of the returns. We are broadening out a bit. But if you've watched small cap at all recently, you can see it hasn't gotten all the way, <laughs> all it, the way down It hasn't there. gotten up there all the way. We saw the S&P 400, the mid-caps, hit a record high of what was last week. And the Russell's still got a ways to go. But it's kind of slowly inching up there. I mean, people have clearly sort of woken up to this idea that there is something else out there other than just, you know, NVIDIA and Microsoft or whatever. And I think that's right. But our view is that that's, that was actually the right decision last year. Like uh-huh. Last year, you had very narrow EPS growth, and right. that drove very narrow equity leadership. Yep. You know, you had, yep. I think, three sectors last year generated year-on-year EPS growth. Mm-hmm. That's going to be eight sectors this year. So our view is this broadening out isn't necessarily a price phenomenon. It's more of an earnings phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we are starting to see earnings broaden out, and therefore you should have broader participation in the markets from our perspective. Yeah. So if I want to play this options market, do I buy calls or do I buy puts at this point? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're still we're still in the uh, in, in the well. If you if you own equities and you're worried, which it sounds like you are, I'm always um, worried. <laughs> then then you can hedge a little bit with puts. But from our, our perspective, you know the implied volatility has declined substantially, both in equities and on a global cross asset basis. So the the sort of 
the pitch to own options is, is a pretty easy one right here. I would say what we saw late last year and early this year was people were actually chasing small cap upside in a pretty aggressive way. Part of that is I think they were short that part of the market. And the other part is you could argue small cap is kind of the soft landing trade. It, it, it benefits from stronger economic growth and it benefits from lower yields. That sort of however you want to, beta grab, if you want to put it that way, has kind of eased out a bit over the last two to four weeks. So we do think, you know, we think from here you can own upside and equities via call options. Um, if you need to hedge, we would actually recommend going a little further out, like owning one to two year type puts on the S&P as opposed to doing mm. that tactically. But yeah, there's, there's a lot to do. Uh, what about in the bond market? Am I doing anything there? <laughs> Because you know, I just want to sit in the ten year, right, and like go home. <laughs> well, look, I think it, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, the if you were hiding in cash last year, let's say you're earning your five percent, um, and you're sitting here today, and the Fed's telling you we're not going into a recession and yields are going to be lower. Well, sort of the argument to stay in cash yields, I think, is has diminished a little bit. So you either probably wanted, to your point, lock in that higher yield for a longer period of time. Or join the rest of us and put some money in equity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, Alex, she's always behind the curve here. Yeah. But it, it does get, to Alex's curve. point, though, I mean, I mean, you have to know, I mean, investor sentiment, investor psychology, there's always that sense that, okay, maybe I miss the big rally. Do I go chase after some of these names and they've already risen 20, 30, 40 percent or something? Even the broader market, and you look at the gains we're sitting on right now on the S&P, I can imagine a lot of people looking in that like, I don't know. I mean, how much more juice is there left? you know, in this year. Yeah, and I think that's right. I mean, you yeah. had the NASDAQ up, what, 40% last year, S&P yeah. up mid-20s. Um, so I think at the beginning of the year, you probably had a little bit of FOMO. Mm -hmm. I, I was hiding in my 5% and I missed 20, and I don't want that to happen again. Mm -hmm. um, then you got that little inflation scare, and I think that's, you know, gave people more confidence to be more cautious, if yeah. that makes sense. And and now I think, look, you got through the quarter. Um, last quarter earnings pretty strong. We've got earnings coming up. The yeah. Fed seems very supportive of the market. So, you know, valuation, yeah. is, uh, valuation is high, it's yeah. not extravagantly high. Yeah. So I don't think valuation is so high at this point that it should keep you out of equities. But yeah. maybe to your point, you need to be a little more selective in terms of what you're picking. Yeah, I was surprised at how dovish Powell was here. Yeah. I mean, he's, uh, we maybe he's on too. board. Maybe, maybe he's buying calls. Stuart, great to have you here on the program. Stuart Kaiser, head of equity trading strategy over at City. Stick with us here on The Close. A lot more coming up out to Las Vegas for the Adobe Summit. We'll be back in a moment. This is Bloomberg. All right, Adobe unveiling a new partnership with Microsoft. It's going to use generative AI power technology to boost the user experience. Pleased to say, joining us now from Las Vegas is Anil Chakravarti. He's president of Adobe's digital experience business. He's out there in Las Vegas where you're having that uh, big summit out there, Anil. And uh, give us some insight here. I mean, when I hear a partnership with Microsoft, I think, okay, that's a no-brainer. We all use Microsoft. Microsoft's out in front here, uh, particularly on the public-facing world of AI. How does Adobe actually fit in with this? Well, thank you for having me on. Yeah, as you know, Microsoft has announced the Copilot. Uh, the Copilot for marketers is the joint announcement we just did with uh, uh, Microsoft. Adobe, as you know, provides uh, digital marketing and customer experience management tools for marketers. This is to accelerate personalization at scale so that they can actually, actually do digital personalization. Now, the work that the marketers do is uh, often something that's manual, has a lot of cumbersome tasks, and a lot of that can be automated with generative AI. So that's what we're partnering with Microsoft to do through the Copilot. And so this will be a joint product, which is a specially built Copilot for marketers through jointly with Adobe and Microsoft. Give us a sense here. What's the cost to do this? Is this already baked in to the current uh, software packages that these companies might have? Or is this an add-on that they pay extra for? Yeah, there are two components to it. One is the actual Copilot that you would buy from Microsoft with the Microsoft 365. And as we're working through the details with Microsoft, there will be an add-on to it specifically for the uh, new capabilities that are available to marketers. Then on the back end, you need software from Adobe, which a lot of customers already have. So this is really gets them get uh, much better advantage and uh, competitive value out of the software that they already have, tools like Adobe Experience Manager or Workfront or Adobe Experience Platform. These are the back end tools that then uh, are used along with the Microsoft Copilot that we are building jointly with them. Anil, it's Alex. Um, how was it to come to this uh, relationship? Was this fraud? Was it easy? Uh, and how many more of these kind of things do you expect to do? Oh, hi, Alex. Yeah, we've had a long-standing partnership with Microsoft. As you know, we partnered with them more than five years ago. 
once we uh, when we announced the uh, Adobe Digital Experience platform, and a lot of the digital experience platform runs on Microsoft Azure. Microsoft and we, we have been partnering on a number of different fronts, and the Gen AI partnership, uh, specifically around the Copilot, really started a few months ago and has uh, gained a lot of momentum as both of us realized that we can bring a lot of value to our joint customers. I think uh, both Microsoft and us are uh, very excited about making this happen. So what's next, more for you guys? Yeah, I think you know a lot of the things that we would do, first, uh, we're actually uh, going to be making a lot more announcements in the next couple of months, jointly working with them. We are actually focused on Adobe building what we call the AI assistant across all of our products. Uh, we've announced the AI assistant for Acrobat, You've seen all of our Adobe Firefly across the Creative Cloud, and we have the AI assistant for the Adobe Experience platform, which is our digital experience business that we announced today. We think all of these tools provide a tremendous amount of value both to existing customers as well as new customers, making it much easier to, uh, to use our products. Uh, so give us a sense here, and just broaden this out for us, Anil, because there's been so much talk about the future of AI, and, and more importantly, its usefulness to uh, the end customer, whether it's a, a corporate customer or an individual customer like myself. Have we reached that point here where not only is this offer some utility or use, but it's also going to be affordable or at least uh, cost effective? Yeah, the great question, Romain, and that has been the theme of our conference here, is how do you take Gen AI, move it from experimentation to real production and business value. Uh, two thirds of marketers have experimented with it, but very few have put it into production for that reason. The key things that they require are making sure that the training data, the models that are used, the applications and interfaces, they all need to be very closely integrated and they all need to be trusted to make sure that the brands that use them can safely use it for their commercial purposes. And that's what Adobe has brought together and so we do believe that it is really now poised to take off for actual commercial deployments because if you take something like Firefly, for example, it's only trained on licensed data. Any images that uh, a, uh, a company that's working with Firefly generates is their intellectual property. Yeah. We make sure that we provide them custom models. So it's really now well positioned yeah. uh, to go into actual production. Anil, really appreciate you taking time out of the summit to talk to us. Anil Chakravarti there, he's the president of Adobe's digital experience business, that summit out there in Las Vegas, a partnership between Adobe, Alex Steele, and Microsoft. Next time you buy a little Microsoft keyboard, Alex, and have a little co-pilot button, you tap that button, and that uh, brings up all your AI features here. Are you sold? What if I don't have a Microsoft keyboard? Well, you're behind the curve then. I am you're like, are you still like shocker. at home on like a little typewriter or something? I don't have a computer at home. Wait, what? Let's drop that right Whoa. there. I don't, right. I have a work computer, but I don't have my own computer at home. Okay. I'm never we, on it. We need to uh, take a break here to digest uh, this latest <laughs> revelation from Alex Steele. When we come back, the UPS CEO, Carol Tomei. I want to welcome our Bloomberg TV and radio audiences. One company that we're watching today is UPS. The company expects sales and profit to grow over the next three years. The company outlined its new strategy during an investor presentation this morning, projecting revenue to grow by as much as $114 billion, an adjusted operating margin above 13% by 2026. Joining us now for more on this plan is Carol Tomei, CEO of UPS. Carol, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's been quite a busy day. I got to ask, the stock is down almost 8%. Investors not liking it. Why? Well, Alex, if I could answer that question, I'd probably have a different job. <laughs> I was really proud of our team today and the, the outline that we provided to grow our company, our revenues and our margin, and invest in the future. So I'd love to talk about our plans and, and how we're going to create value over the long term. So to, first of all, that was a great answer. Um, second of all, I think to the point, what some analysts were pointing out was a couplefold. One is that you're going to have to maybe raise prices in order to meet some of these estimates in a tough growth environment. So I wanted to get uh, your thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, so give us your thoughts on that first. I'm happy to. So we uh, divided our growth into three different segments, the U.S., international, and then supply chain solutions, 
with an overarching theme of growth in healthcare. And healthcare logistics is probably the most exciting growth opportunity we have ahead of us. The addressable market, well, it's big, $152 billion, although we're focusing on the complex side of healthcare logistics, which is about $82 billion. Last year, our healthcare logistics revenue was $10 billion. Over the next three years, we plan to double that to $20 billion. So that's one way we're going to grow without raising prices. We're just going to lean into a, an opportunity that values our end-to-end -end complex logistics network. If we come back to the United States, we plan to grow revenue by about $10 billion. Part of that will come from volume growth, and part of that will come from higher revenue per piece. But on the revenue per piece, don't be confused by the growth there. Part of that is leaning into parts of the market that really value our end-to-end -end network, like small and medium-sized businesses. And those packages tend to have a higher revenue per piece than other packages. Yeah. We also are leaning into the B2B space, and those packages tend to have a higher revenue per piece. Yeah. And then finally, well, we do tend to raise prices every year. We have something called a general rate increase. Uh, our general rate increase for 2024 is 5.9%. Now, I don't think we'll hold all of that, but we should hold about 50% of that. I am curious, though, Carol, when you talk about those growth targets and those ambitions, where are those customers coming from? Are, are they basically with one of your rivals now, and you think that maybe you can sort of poach some of those people? Or are these new folks that maybe aren't really using a shipping and logistics service right now that will now somehow uh, find you at UPS? So the answer is yes to all above. So if I think about healthcare logistics, it's highly fragmented with tens of thousands of players in that space. We have an opportunity to grow into the space because we have an end-to-end -end solution coupled with cold chain packaging ultra cold chain packaging. So we are the best in the world in that and we can aggregate this fragmented market into an end-to-end -end solution. If we think about growth outside the United States, the addressable market that we're going after is about $50 billion. And that's held by other players, players that you can think of like, oh, the largest player in, in the world outside the United States, for example. So there will be a share shift opportunity as we continue to sell across our end-to-end -end portfolio. And this really differentiates us from many of the players in our market because we believe in orchestration. Yeah. Because so, we have an end-to-end -end network, we can change the mode yeah. that you need to ship your product the most efficiently. So that's the sales growth story going forward. Talk to me a little bit about the bottom line, about margins. You've already been in cost-cutting mode. We've seen at least announcements of some of those layoffs here. What more is coming? What more should investors expect? Yes. So last year, as you know, the small package market shrunk from where it had been the previous year. And so we looked at that reality and, and said we've got to right size our business to meet the size of our company. So we did make some decisions to do just that under an operating model of fit to serve. Moving past that though is the very exciting opportunity that we have to drive out cost through automation. Do you know that we have over 1,000 buildings in the United States? And many of these buildings were built 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we're 117 years old as a company. And as we looked at the buildings, we said, my gosh, we have an opportunity actually to consolidate buildings, consolidate buildings that aren't automated into brand new automated buildings and drive productivity. So we call this network of the future, which we announced this morning, and it's very exciting. We will have, by the end of our initial phase, we will have 400 buildings that are fully automated. And with this automation, well, we're going to drive out cost. We'll drive out $3 billion of cost between now and 2028, and about half of that will be realized by 2026. Carol, does, so the automation doesn't necessarily just mean layoffs? Automation is automating inside of the buildings. It means everything. Using automation for route optimization, using automation to change addresses, using automation to change uh, to sort packages, of course, mm -hmm. using automation to actually put packages into package cars and then deliver it. So it's end-to-end -end automation. And with end-to-end -aut -end automation, yeah, there's a productivity opportunity, which means we don't need as many people to move the packages inside of the buildings that we have today. 
but there's an opportunity that, for those people to do something else. So as we lean to automation and technology, particularly generative AI, there's an opportunity to move off of the floor of the building and go into the control rooms. To so then going back to the health care, well, I guess in general, you, you, you had mentioned that um, revenue targets will include $6 billion of inorganic growth. Where is the priority for that? Um, where would you like to be spending most of that money? So most of that $6 billion is in what we call a pipeline. We've been actively looking at opportunities to expand our healthcare logistics portfolio. In fact, we've made a couple of acquisitions recently, one BOMI, the second MNX Global Logistics. Both of these acquisitions enhanced our capabilities, particularly in cold chain. So as we think about opportunities going forward, we're going to look for those enabling um, acquisitions. They're all around the world. It's like a string of pearls. There's no large acquisition, but a string of acquisitions that will continue to uh, enhance our capabilities and allow us to grow. So the number wasn't made up. It's based on a pipeline that we're actively working. Uh, Carol, I do want to uh, ask you a, a bit of a broader question here, just about the health of our supply chains here in the U.S. As you know, uh, there was a horrific uh, and tragic accident overnight in Baltimore, uh, the loss of life. But of course, now a lot of people looking at the potential economic toll, the need to reroute ships, the need to reroute ground transportation, rail transportation in order to get things off the ship. Is UPS in any way affected uh, by the collapse of that bridge? Well, our hearts goes out to those who were affected. It was just a horrific accident. Uh, we have checked in on all of our UPS folks in that area, and, and all of our folks are safe, th thank goodness. Um, because we do have an end-to-end -end global supply chain, we can reroute prod uh, products to different ports around the world. We can also move it off of the air. Off the, off of the ocean and put it into the air will help help reroute the, the world. We do this as a matter of course. We can. And so for the customers that, your existing customers that depend on you, depend on UPS, and more importantly, the folks at the end of that line who also depend on getting delivery of those things for medicine and other things that are critical here, yeah. what type of disruptions, if at all, should they expect? Well, I can't speak to the specific accident because I don't know the cargo on the carrier. But when it comes off the carrier, we'll help to get it routed. And for on, because there'll need to be a repair, obviously, you can reroute ocean freight to ports like in Savannah or up the northeast coast. So we'll, we've, we've got a presence everywhere so we can assist in that. Carol, before we let you go, because we're staying on, on the macro theme, what's your take on the U.S. economy? How are we doing so from our, our perspective, the U.S. economy is very resilient. And the good news from a year ago is that inflation rates have come down because inflation actually had an impact to our business, a negative impact. Think about this. When inflation rates were 6% or higher, particularly in the area of food, more and more consumers' wallets were going to food purchases, and those purchases, well, they don't ship through our small package network. So as inflation has come down now to 3%, and the Fed has indicated it's on its way to 2 that's better news for us because more dollars can go into goods rather than just food. But it does appear to be a resilient economy. And if I look outside of the United States, candidly, we're seeing some green shoots coming out of the China-Asia trade lane, particularly as it relates to what we, the softness that we saw a year ago. Carol, we really appreciate you taking time to be with us today. I know a very busy day for you as you really try to sell the UPS story. Carol Tomei, she is the CEO of United Parcel Service. And we do want to go back uh, to that uh, big news of the day, the big national news, and that is the bridge collapse out there in Baltimore, Maryland. The governor of Maryland, Westmore, speaking right now alongside Pete Buttigieg and Senator Ben Cardin. Let's listen in. Uh, I know you have had no rest in a very long time, sir. And so I want to say how much we appreciate you. Uh, but also, it's to the members of the philanthropic community who have been reaching out and offering support. It's the members of the private sector who have been reaching out and offering support. It's the sandwich companies who have said we're going to shut down because we just want to make sure that the first responders are getting meals. Everybody has stepped up. Everybody has raised their hands to serve. And I can tell you, it is so deeply appreciated. It's so deeply felt. And for everyone who is offering prayers and supports, I can tell you those prayers are working and we are grateful. And the thing that I would ask for people to remember is this. 
The first, this is very much still a search and rescue mission. We are still actively looking for survivors. We know, and that's the pledge we've made to these families, and this is still very much an active search and rescue mission. And there is not a single resource that we will hold off on deploying. I have already authorized the deployment of everything from air and and resources to make sure that this search and rescue operation is carried out to its fullest intent. The second thing I want to remind people is that this will not be short. There's going to be a long road. There's going to be a long road, not just as we go from search and rescue. There'll be a long road as we talk about what does the future of this region, the future of the area look like. And we're going to need each and every one of you. We're thankful to have partners like what we have in the Biden-Harris administration. We're thankful for the partners that we have in our federal delegation. We're thankful for the partners we have in our state and local leadership. We're thankful for the partners that we have in the private sector and the philanthropic community. We're thankful for the partners that we have within the Moore-Miller administration. We're thankful for each and every one of you, both Marylanders and non-Marylanders, who have reached out and offered support. We feel it. We need it. And we are truly grateful for it. And I think just in this time, this state has been able to show what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. And this state and this city will continue to show exactly that. And so with that, I want to turn it over to our Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, with a deep sense of thanks and appreciation. Oh, I apologize. Before I turn it over to Secretary Buttigieg, I want to turn it over to, uh, to the dean of our, of our, uh, of our delegation uh, and someone who has been leading from the front this entire time, and we are deeply grateful for the leadership of Senator Ben Cardin. Governor Moore, first of all, thank you very much for getting our whole team together uh, to meet this challenge. And our prayers are with the families of those that are lost at sea at this moment. As the governor said, it's still a search and rescue. So we are hopeful uh, and we are with the families. I also want to underscore our thanks to our first responders. They did an extraordinary job acting very quickly and saved lives. So we thank our first responders for everything that they have done. I, I just really want to underscore a couple points. Our first priority is the search and rescue for those that were uh, on the bridge. We then need to make sure that the, the, that the channel is reopened. It's critically important to our economy. Uh, it affects many, many jobs. It affects not only jobs here in Maryland, but around the country and, they, and world. So our, our next priority is to make sure we get that channel opened. And then we also need to fix and replace the bridge for the surface transportation. We're going to work together as a team. I am very impressed by all the partners that are with us today. We heard from them at the state level, the local level, at the federal level. I particularly want to acknowledge our federal partners. The Secretary of Transportation is with us. We have the Coast Guard. We have the Army Corps of Engineers. We have the investigators. We have the Small Business Administration. They're all here because of the commitment of the partners to work together. A special thanks to President Biden, who's made it very, very clear that he'll do everything in his power to make sure that we get the help we need to deal with this challenge. But as Secretary Buttigieg told us in our briefings, he's going to need the help of Congress in order to get things done. So I want to acknowledge our team, Senator Van Hollen, my partner in the United States Senate on the Appropriations Committee and the work that he's doing. Congressman Infume is here. Congressman Trone is here. Team Maryland, our federal delegation, is committed to working together. Senator Van Hollen and I got calls from our leadership that said they're prepared, Secretary Buttigieg, to do everything that we need to do in Congress to make sure you have the resources and the federal partners have the resources in order to get the job done. So I want to thank Senator Schumer for his call and his comments. Uh, Senator Murray, uh, Senator Carper, Chair of the Environment and Public Works Committee, have all been in touch with us. It is a team effort, and we're going to make sure that we do everything we can to protect our economy, and protect the people of our state. And with that, let me just turn it back to the governor or Secretary Buttigieg. This guy woke all of us up early this morning, so thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, and uh, I want to thank Senator Cardin and the entire delegation for their leadership. Uh, they have been on this from the first moments. Uh, and as the senator mentioned, and I'll say more about this in a moment, we'll be needing to work together uh, to make sure that uh, we uh, render all of the support that is needed at the federal level. I want to recognize the leadership of Governor Moore, who was already wide awake and hard at work when I reached him in the middle of the night. Uh, we just had a very informative briefing with his extraordinary leadership team. And I was moved to see the partnership uh, between uh, state as well as county and uh, city personnel, uh, led by the county executive and the mayor, working hand in glove. Uh, with us and with our sister federal agencies. And if there's one thing I have to say today, it is a note of gratitude for the extraordinary and courageous work of the first responders, uh, some of whom are in that cold water right now, some of whom are from right here, some of whom have traveled in to render mutual aid, all of whom are responding with extraordinary professionalism and whose work has already saved lives. And to those uh, state, county, and local responders, I would add uh, the extraordinary work of the United States Coast Guard. We should also recognize that this is an excruciating day for several families who went to bed last night uh, having it be a normal night and woke up today to news that no one wants to receive. They are hoping and praying, and we are hoping and praying with them. We are all putting our arms around the community of Baltimore, and uh, that, uh, that is true for all of this country. I've even heard from counterparts uh, as far away as the United Kingdom uh, reaching out to express their support to the people of Baltimore. As been mentioned, I've uh, been in close contact uh, with uh, uh, the governor, the mayor, county leadership, and the congressional delegation. Uh, and as President Biden has made clear, the federal government will provide all of the support that they need for as long as it takes. This is no ordinary bridge. This is one of the cathedrals of American infrastructure. It has been part of the skyline of this region for longer than many of us have been alive. So the path to normalcy will not be easy. It will not be quick. It will not be inexpensive. But we will rebuild together. In order to make sure that happens, the president's plan is to work with everyone here uh, in order to rebuild this bridge and reopen this port, including our readiness as a department to approve emergency funding as soon as we receive that request. Meanwhile, our Maritime Administration will help with port, harbor, and supply chain operations. Uh, our Federal Highway Administration will assist when it comes to the bridge itself and any ways that we can help ease roadway congestion for residents and commuters who can no longer uh, use this major thoroughfare. Uh, the the Federal Aviation Administration is even involved, uh, working to keep the airspace uh, above the bridge clear for emergency personnel. FIMSA, our Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration, is on the scene to help with any hazmat issues. And our newly stood up freight office is already at work preparing for supply chain impacts that we know are coming because of the importance of this port, not just to the Baltimore region, uh, but really to the entire United States uh, economy. We're going to be working closely with the National Transportation Safety Board as they lead their independent investigation uh, and with the Coast Guard as they continue operations in the water. I've also spoken with Secretary Mayorkas, who's working to ensure that all DHS assets are integrated. So in many ways, our work is just beginning to rebuild this bridge and deal with impacts in the meantime, to reopen this port and deal with supply chain impacts in the meantime. But today, we are most acutely focused on the emergency operations underway uh, and on the families that have been impacted. I have no doubt that we will rebuild together and that Baltimore will come back stronger than ever before. And with that, I will turn it back over to the governor to lead the media questions. Governor? Governor, any news on uh, uh, the Mr. There's, a, there, there's, there's no new information uh, about the, the, the search efforts um, that we know that we still have. Uh, we still have the six individuals who are missing. Governor, Governor. When, when you talk about the investigative standpoint, how concerned are you if there were any safety violations on this ship or, or the track record of the owner operator? And Mr. Secretary, if you could speak to that as well, do you have any concerns about that? Mayor Scott, we also didn't hear from you. What are your thoughts on this tragedy today? 
Um, well, I'll, I'll take it first, and I can pass it off to, to Ms. Mayor. Uh, Thank you. I, I know there's a, there's a thorough investigation that's going to be going on about everything that took place last night, the things that led up to it, and also the aftermath. Uh, and so I, I don't have any further comments about uh, any, any concerns that we have about the companies that are involved, because there's still a thorough investigation that's going to take place. Thank you, Mr. Governor. Uh, I think we all know uh, this is an unspeakable tragedy. And while, as the governor just said, and we we're just listening to government officials on the ground outside of Baltimore, Maryland, after that really stunning collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge that spans the Baltimore Harbor. Pete Buttigieg, the transportation secretary of the U.S., calling it one of the cathedrals to American infrastructure. He says there will be a rebuilding process, but it will not be inexpensive and it will be long. Officials still trying to assess the human toll as well. We heard from Wes Moore, the governor of Maryland, as well as Senator Ben Cardin of uh, Maryland as well. All of them trying to uh, usher support here uh, for the rescue efforts and eventually, Alex Steele, the rebuilding efforts. Romain Bostic here alongside Alex Steele. We are counting you down uh, to the closing bells, waking up this morning to something that's, at least on the surface, not really a market story. No, but like yeah. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I mean, that yeah. this could actually uh, happen. Now, in terms of the supply chain issue, in terms of logistics, that's always interesting to parse through as well uh, over the next coming weeks and days. Uh, in terms of the equity market, though, it's a pretty soft day. Uh, volume yeah. is a little bit light. You're looking at the S&P now slipping into negative territory, down by about one-tenth of one percent. Uh, I did want to highlight an interesting downgrade uh, by her for, uh, for Hershey's uh, over at BNP Paribas, saying that the cocoa prices that we've seen remain. We talked oh. about this yesterday. Oh, no, stop. That that's actually maybe structural and yeah. then it's going to eat in over years and then yeah. so they had to downgrade this is why i Hershey's switched to for twizzlers that. yeah I actually love Twizzlers. Yeah, there you go. I do. It's, it's, it's my one candy weakness. Um, and I just wanted to also point out UPS, still the worst performing stock uh, on the S&P. Although, Carol uh, Tomei, the CEO, made the pitch to us that long-term growth story and cost-cutting and automation would provide a lot of value. All right. We've only got seven minutes until the closing bells. Let's get right to it. Chris Aylman joining us right now, friend of the program and chief investment officer over at Calsters. And I do want to start just in the moment right now, Chris, because we came into this day and we saw the market open higher since the we started our program about an hour ago. The market has dipped into the red, and there's been a lot of questions about the sustainability of this rally, and more importantly, what investor sentiment is really signaling right now. You know, Romain, it's always good to talk to you. Tough day for Baltimore, so our heart yeah. goes out to them. I've got a bridge right next to me that's built in 1911, so our infrastructure's old in America. But listen, I, I think that investors are uh, running out of gas. The market is uh, certainly priced uh, near perfection. PE, you know, adjusted around 21, according to my trade desk. So it's not out of the question, but I think that we've seen lots of gains already this year. And it's not unusual, even in a bull market year, to have some pullback. So I don't know when, but this equity market isn't going to go straight to the moon. Uh, so, yeah, I think that we should have some slow periods. Seems like we're in one this week as we wait for inflation. Hey, Chris, we were talking uh, earlier to, to Stuart Kaiser over at City about do you do stocks or do you do bonds? Like, yeah, if you want the straight up income play, maybe you want to buy the long end. Uh, but in terms of price appreciation, that's really a stock play. What say you? Alex, I'm going to play off your earlier comment, a family joke of ours. Is it Twizzlers or licorice? The answer is yes, it is stocks <laughs> and it's bonds. We're going to do both. Um, and we are both. You know, so uh, I'm going to play off Larry Fink's uh, uh, letter that's coming out on retirement in America. America needs to have a balanced portfolio. And that, you know, when the equity market runs like this, that's when people need to take some profits and actually rebalance. Bonds have a yield. You can actually make a decent return out of a bond portfolio. And I think it is time for people to have some bonds. Not 100% of one and the, or the other. The answer is and, yes. I want both. I want bonds and I want equities. Uh, it's interesting you bring up uh, Larry Fink. I mean, there was so much talk about his comments about the retirement crisis, and David Wesson had a chance to sit down with him, and he talked a lot about just uh, fiscal issues and a lot of things that I'm sure you know, Chris, as, and we, the royal we, have kind of kicked the can down the road for years, if not decades. Uh, is it as imminent and dire as he made it seem? Hey, I haven't kicked it down the road. I don't know, Romaine, if you're implying Alex has kicked it down the road. I'm just saying. Yeah, we always blame Alex. Yeah, yeah I know. We, yeah. we, the royal yeah. we. I didn't know we became royal on Bloomberg, but that's okay. 
Let's go with yes and yes, it, it is a crisis. Uh, you know, and I'm going to emphasize something not just about infrastructure, which is on our mind today, but the 401ks. Uh, you know, obviously, I'm a defined benefit plan. I believe in mixing together all the liabilities. And as Larry points out, longevity is a serious risk. At CalSTRS, we have over 400 retirees that are over 100 years old still getting a pension. So I understand the longevity risk. And I think that 401ks, we have a real serious risk of the baby boom running yeah. out and outliving their money. And we should point out, this is a global phenomenon. And we only have a couple minutes left, Chris, but I want to get your thoughts about that shift in pension investments. The idea that we went from uh, those sort of uh, defined payment plans to uh, more of a, a contribution plans. And for some cases, no plan at all. You're just on your own. How much of that maybe led to the comments that we heard from Fink today? Well, it's that. And, you know, in the backdrop is Social Security. It's not exactly in good footing as the baby boom. My generation starts hitting into it. So it's both. I think Larry Sings, the, the average American family, as he said, has very little in savings, barely $400 for an emergency. And people generally don't save enough for retirement. It is so hard to get the attention of a 20 and 30 year old and get them to save for their future. They think about it when they're 50, but frankly, it's too late. Mm -hmm. The power of compounding, you know this, yeah. Romaine, the power of compounding is amazing. And yeah. investing in this equity market and compounding is the key. All right, Chris, got to leave it there. Always great to talk to you. Christopher Ailman, Chief Investment Officer over at CalSTRS, helping us count down to the closing bells here on a day where stocks did open higher and looked like they were set to break a losing streak, a flip-flop into the red as we move closer to those bells. A full breakdown of all the action today as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with the entire team. Scarlett Fu joining us in the TV studio. Carol Masser and Tim Stenevik in the radio fishbowl. Welcome to our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms. And what, Carol Masser, yeah. looks like it's going to be another down day. Modest losses, but a third straight day of decline. Modest losses. And again, I'm struck by some selling into the close, right? I feel like, again, this is a trend line we haven't seen. And I think this is the second day in a row. Yeah. Where we're kind of seeing this movement. And it just makes me wonder, are investors a little bit nervous about Maybe not getting those three rate cuts or two rate cuts and maybe not even one well, rate cut this year. Well, we should point out, too, I mean, we're at the end of the quarter, too, or end of the month and the quarter as well. So and given how much equities have run up, you're probably going to see a little selling, maybe some profit taking and rebalancing. And why not? I mean, year to date up 9 percent. So for, that's a pretty good quarter uh, on the S&P 500. Uh, on the uh, Nasdaq composite, uh, up 8.7 percent. Um, look, not the end of the quarter yet at this point, Scarlett, but um, that's a pretty good one. Yeah, um, well, prepare for the next two days to look like uh, today as well, where you just have a lot of nibbling around the edges. No one wants to make any big moves, especially with PCE coming out on Friday when the markets close. You're not really going to be able to react to that until Monday morning. Totally right. Also, I should point out that the S&P is, what, 13 to 14 percent above its 200-day moving average. So we've been quite extended. So any kind of softness shouldn't be too much of a surprise on that front. Absolutely. And you fold into that what for a lot of people is basically a holiday week. Uh, a lot of folks uh, on vacation with a uh, Good Friday on Friday and, of course, Easter Sunday are coming up as well. A volume slightly lower than where it normally would be over the last 30 days. Modest losses here on the day as we get the closing bells in New York. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lower by less than a tenth of a percent down, roughly about 15 points as we wait for these numbers to settle. The S&P also down by a similar amount, roughly 14 points. That's about three-tenths of a percent lower. The Nasdaq Composite is going to finish out the day lower by about four-tenths of a percent. And the Russell 2000 down on the day by two-tenths of a percent. All right, digging a little bit deeper into the S&P 500. So those big cap companies, hey, folks, almost an even split, but a little bit more to the downside. 214 names, Scarlett, actually higher for the session, the Tuesday trade, 282 to the downside, and you've got seven unchanged. All right, let's take a look at the sectors uh, through the IMAP. It'll show you that 
that. Eight out of the 11 sectors are in the red. Plenty of red there. Um, in terms of the big decliners, you have utilities and uh, tech and energy leading the way down. Ironically, or maybe not so ironically, two of those groups were among the best performers yesterday. Healthcare, financials, and staples kind of bucking the decline, but not by a whole lot. They're up uh, at most by a third of 1%. All right, guys, to the individual gainers, I go. The number two gainer in the NASDAQ 100 today is Tesla. That stock at its highs up uh, about 6.7%, finishing the day just shy of 3%. Uh, an Italian newspaper out reporting that officials at the country's industry uh, ministry contacted Tesla about potential production of electric trucks. So maybe some speculating that that's why we saw Tesla trend a little bit higher in today's session. We know Tesla has certainly been under pressure. Stocks down about 28% so far in 2024. Oh, look at that board you got there. This is like the Carol Massa board. Tesla, <laughs> Trump, and Krispy Kreme. Yeah, that's my world. <laughs> they that's just put Royal Caribbean on there and we're all set. That's me in a nutshell. No, the NASDAQ Golden Dragon Index. <laughs> all right, all right. Whoa. All right, I'm moving along here. All right, let's go to uh, the ticker D DJT, which stands for, of course, Donald J. Trump. It's actually called Trump Media and Technology Group. Uh, that one up almost 60 percent at its highs today. It's first official day of trading. We know it was a SPAC. Um, and so, of course, a merger with Digital World Acquisition. Um, it's an unprofitable company. This is something that we've been trying to dig into a little bit more today. Uh, finishing the day with a 16 percent gain, uh, but soaring. It did also trigger a brief volatility related trading halt. But nonetheless, as I said, uh, some outperformance in that one. Day two will be an interesting trade, no doubt. Krispy Kreme, yes, I actually don't eat Krispy Kreme. Um, but nonetheless, if you go to McDonald's That's now. That's quite the flex. Uh, <laughs> just, you just don't like donuts? No, they're not donuts. They're like sugar blown up in donut form. They're like air, right? Yeah, they're, they're like air sugar. That they're like really air sugar. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, anyway, investors kind of gobbling them up today. Uh, stocks up uh, almost about 40% in today's session, $17.35 a share as they uh, close. Uh, soaring the most since, I think, 2021. McDonald's, July of 2021. McDonald's agreeing to bring uh, the donuts yeah, to restaurants would, across the U.S. that would be the, the IPO, Carol Masser. Thank you very much. Okay. This is why we have you here, those little nuggets why? that just make us <laughs> Thank smarter. Thank you, because I, I was trying to figure out. That's exactly why. <laughs> Uh, nonetheless, the nationwide rollout is expected by the end of 2026, so some of you will have to wait. I'm, I'm done. I'm You're done? done? Yes. Yeah, okay. Let's see what Tim has. <laughs> I do want to start with uh, UPS. You guys were just speaking to uh, UPS CEO Carol Tomei a little earlier. Shares ended up closing down 8%. The company did come out and say earlier today that sales and profit will grow over the next three years, um, but investors were skeptical that the targets uh, are within reach. The stock fell. Alex, I loved your question. You started the interview to Carol Tomei asking her why investors aren't liking what they saw Earlier in the presentation, she said, "If I can answer that question, I would probably have a different job." It was a pretty good. It was a pretty good CEO answer. Yeah, like, I, I respected mean, her for throwing it that. <laughs> kudos to kudos to you too. Um, hey, also. Um, Keep an eye on shares of, uh, of Maersk, the uh, ADRs at least here that are traded here in the U.S., uh, doing that, of course, because the DALI, the Singapore registered container ship that struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore early this morning, was operated by a charter company, uh, Synergy Group, but is time chartered by Maersk, carrying Maersk customers' cargo. Uh, the company did say none of its crew and personnel were on the vessel. Shares today down, uh, ADRs down 2.44%. And then how about a little... Uh, and I saw some of the some of the other stocks related yeah. to uh, that Baltimore report also moving lower, including a lot of those uh, coal companies as well. Yeah, um, uh, certainly a, a, um, worth keeping an eye on what happens when it comes to supply chain challenges uh, over uh, this tragedy. And we'll, of course, keep you updated on that. Um, how about a little paper company M&A to round things out? International paper shares falling 6.5% uh, on the day. Uh, this after reports that the company wants to launch a formal offer for the British multinational packaging business. D.S. Smith. The concern that international paper investors may have is over a possible bidding war because Mondi uh, did agree to buy it for about uh, $6.5 billion uh, just a little bit ago. Uh, Sky News did report that international paper was considering an offer for $6.31 billion or more for D.S. Smith. So a little paper uh, packaging bidding war happening here, potentially. Uh, a side note on Maersk, I was talking to a BI analyst, Bloomberg Intelligence analyst, and think of Maersk in this instance as basically the rider in an Uber. Hmm. So they're not the Uber or the driver or the car, they're uh, just the person in the back seat. But, I thought that was really helpful. But they do have it. cargo on there. Yeah, but you're just riding in it. Yeah. You, you're just riding in it. Yeah. Yield's doing nothing. That's what I got. <laughs> okay, that's a good... That's Wasn't a, there a bond auction? Yeah, yeah, but you got something. All right, yeah, we have GameStop earnings. Um, and when I say earnings, yeah, maybe it turned a profit <laughs> in the fourth quarter 
Adjusted EPS of the fourth quarter was 22 cents. Analysts were looking for 30 cents. When I say analysts, literally two analysts uh, had projections. So take it with a grain of salt. Fourth quarter net sales, Carol, $1.79 billion. Analysts, two of them, were looking for $2.05 billion. Yeah, and just to remind everybody, I mean, it's down about, what, 11 12% so far this year, and it's got a huge short position on it. About 22% remain yeah. of the float is shorted. So, yeah. Yeah, but this just kind of continues that trend. We were joking yesterday with Bailey Lipschultz about the idea that there are actually showing profitability this quarter, and Bailey pointed out that's because it's a holiday quarter, <laughs> but you still got sales down 20% or 19% on a year-over-year basis, which seems to be the trend that they've had now for, I don't know, what, how many quarters? I've lost track. 14? I, I would say we'll find out more on the conference call. Will we? But there will be no conference call oh, okay. today for GameStop. <laughs> oh. Once again, the company <laughs> saying Nicely played. Uh, they will not be holding a conference call today, uh, but referring people to the 10K. Uh, oh, for additional information. That's very accessible cool. to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's knocked down 13%. But, you know, if I pair this with with the DJT, clearly meme stocks are still of interest, just maybe not GameStop at this moment. Where's the growth coming from for this company? Because I'm just going through hardware what is it doing and again? accessories down 12%. <laughs> software sales down 31%. Collectibles down 25%. Do they still have hard, like actual stores? That's yeah, not they do. They do. That, they do. They do. That's, oh, wow. you know, they business do. going down, right? Yeah. That's not growth. Like you say, you do wonder, right? It's not growth. Like, why are There's a negative sign it? in front of it. Expenses are going down 21% year over year, so that's a good thing. <laughs> okay. Long-term debt remains limited to a low interest rate uh, environment. That's something. Anyway, well, that's knocked down 15%. Can we, can we talk 15%. about donuts? Can we talk about more about go back, donuts? You want to do more about donuts? Or yeah. how about, wait, you want to talk about Do you remember, food? well, speaking of which, remember when Krispy Kreme was like the meme stock? Uh, oh, yeah. Way back, back when. in the day, yeah. yeah. Way back I once got day. yelled at by my boss because I told him, you know, it wasn't really a news story. <laughs> Yet here, like, and look at it now. Look, McDonald's, like, you know, wants them in their stores. Yeah, well, so. That's actually one thing that surprises me about the Krispy Kreme story is just how long it's going to take for this rollout. They said by next year they'll have this partnership in Anything place. that McDonald's does takes a long just time. Just scale? because of the scale. You it's can't so make massive. happy meals happy so quickly or happier. Exactly. It's just a t- Changing one ingredient causes all these ripple effects up and down the supply chain. I thought we were getting healthier. Forgive me. Forgive me. I thought we were going to healthier food. Well, yeah, you can do that, and then you can get your injection of your weight loss drug. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to Sarcastic or Sarcasm Television. This is just kind of that mood. Uh, yeah, kind of interesting. All right, guys, that is a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. We will see you. We will be happier, maybe, tomorrow. We'll see you from Beyond the Bell. All right, as we say goodbye to our radio colleagues, stick with us here on Bloomberg Television. A lot more coming up on the close, a deeper dive into the results out of GameStop, down about 18% right now in After Hours Trading. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu with Romaine Bostic. It is the last week of the first quarter and a holiday shortened trading week, and the price action pretty much reflects that. The volume certainly does. We have not much change across the asset classes, although there was a little bit of a late swoon for equities in the S&P 500, finishing down about a quarter of 1%. The VIX briefly dipped below 13, but inched back up again. The 10-year yield not moving a whole lot, down one basis point, 4.22%. Even Bitcoin not doing a whole lot, unusually for Bitcoin. Uh, taking a breather after three days of gains. Let's get you to some individual movers. And I picked a bunch of gainers because why not? Uh, DJT, this has become kind of the new meme stock of the moment. In its first day of trading, rose as much as 59% after listing through a merger with a blank check company. Uh, This pop certainly provides a windfall for the former president, at least on paper, as he faces mounting legal and financial issues. Tesla, up for a third day, now up uh, 3% on the day. It's actually trading at a three-week high. The Italian newspaper Il Sole 24 Ore reports that officials at the country's industry ministry contacted Tesla about potential production of electric trucks. So that giving a little bit of a tailwind to Tesla. Viking Therapeutics, uh, one of the big gainers in the Russell 2000, up almost 17%. Uh, The startup unveiled encouraging results from an early stage uh, study of its experimental weight loss pill. So uh, good news for that. And of course, that would be competing with the syringe shots that are currently available. And Krispy Kreme, speaking of meme stocks, which we'll get into a little bit later on, closing the day up almost 40% after McDonald's agreed to bring uh, the chain's 
donuts to its stores. It'll start rolling them out at select McDonald's this year, and a full nationwide rollout is expected by the end of 2026. So slow going there, but eventually it'll make its way over. Romain? All right, we do want to get back to the big national story of the day, and that is the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland now uh, stepping up to the podium, I believe, for a press conference. I think we can go out to him right now and hear what he has to say. Well, Romaine, this is Kaylee Lyons live on the scene in Baltimore. I am here with Senator Cardin, who was just speaking at a press conference together with the governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, as well as the transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg, as we all are grappling with uh, the tragedy that occurred here today and the collapse of the bridge. Senator, thank you so much for making time for Bloomberg. Obviously, this is still an ongoing search and rescue effort. At what point will it turn from search and rescue to trying to reopen this port, trying to start reconstruction on the bridge? Is there any kind of time frame you can give us here. Well, they're they're starting those efforts, but not in the, not to conflict with the search and re rescue, rescue, which is the primary the priority right this moment. So, search and rescue is the priority, but they're already planning on what's going to be necessary to get the channel open and to get this bridge replaced. Uh, every day it's closed. Every day the harbor's closed. It's millions and millions of dollars lost to the local economy. People are going to be out of work. They're not going to get paychecks. We've got to move with great dispatch. But first, let's see whether we can't save some lives. Well, and we've heard from the governor, of course, that saving lives is the number one priority at this point. We also heard from him a description that this is not going to be short. We heard similarly from Secretary Buttigieg talking about how this could be a, a long haul here. What kind of timeline are you expecting in terms of when we could see transit flowing again? Well, here, here's the challenge. You've got a large vessel that's stuck in the channel, partly in the channel, partly not in the channel. It's got fully cargo, thousands of containers. You have a bridge uh, lying on top of it. It's not stable. So it's going to take time to make sure that it's safe for workers to be able to remove the debris. That's going to take some time. So we'd like to see the channel opened as quickly as possible, and we're going to make sure it's done that way. But it's got to be done safely in a manner in which it will allow commerce to continue. Uh, we're looking for alternatives in the meantime. We're going to do everything we can to keep our economy flowing. We heard from President Biden earlier today, and he suggested that the federal government will be footing the bill. Essentially, he would like to see the federal government paying for the reconstruction of this bridge. He would have to ask you and your colleagues, though, in Congress for that funding. Do you have any doubt, Senator, that that funding will indeed pass? Because we've seen some difficulty in the funding department in Washington these days. First, let me thank President Biden. He was very clear. I, I had a chance to talk with him, and he was very clear about the federal government doing everything in its power to, to cover the costs and to help us get it done quickly as possible. He has a lot of authority and he has a lot of uh, resources available. He'll probably need more from Congress. Our delegation is laser focused on making sure we get the help from the federal government, from the Congress that's needed. I've already been in contact with Senator Schumer and Senator Carper and other members of the Senate. They've pledged to the help. I'm optimistic we'll get the help from Congress. All right. And Senator, finally, as we are still here in Washington talking about the search efforts underway, have you had any update on those six individuals that are still unaccounted for? Have any of them been found at this point, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, none of them have been found to date. My knowledge is about an hour old, so I don't know what's happened in the last hour. Uh, I know that there's active searches going on by the Coast Guard, but as of this moment, the six are still unaccounted for. All right, Senator Ben Cardin, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And Romain, we'll send it back to you. Senator Ben Cardin there on the ground out there just outside of Baltimore, uh, the site scene of the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. And as he just talked about, still assessing the loss of life and any other casualties out there, but also looking ahead now to the rebuilding process. Dan Close is joining us. He's the head of municipals over at Nuveen, which has about $188 billion in assets under management. And Dan, I do want to start off with the comments that the senator was talking about, the idea that the federal government might actually foot the bill for this. Sure. Maybe they don't. Maybe this does become much more of a municipal process, one that might actually require some degree of municipal borrowing here. Have you ever been kind of in the mix of something like this, a project like this, of this size and scale, and not just size and scale, but one that we assume is going to have to be done relatively quickly? 
quickly. Sure. And, and thank you so much yeah. for having me on the show. Um, you know, we do see this commonly in the municipal market. If you look at uh, floods, if you look at hurricanes, if you look at wildfires, uh, Hurricane Katrina came through, uh, was a awful, uh, you know, catastrophic flood that came through. But we always do see the federal government come in despite the politics. So, mm -hmm. you know, I know that it is a tough time in Washington right now and getting anything through is difficult. Mm -hmm. But for, you know, any of these types of uh, catastrophes, federal yeah. money does come through from FEMA. And we'd expect nothing different in this case. Um, you know, if you looked at uh, Hurricane Katrina, for instance, mm -hmm. there was not a single municipal default, even though state and local governments uh, did shut down. We had a hospital shut down, right. uh, local water credits shut down. But we usually do not see any defaults because of federal state money coming through. And we should point out our analysts over at Bloomberg Intelligence have been looking at the possibility of defaults. They say that with the existing structures of some of those muni deals that are already out there, right. that there are enough provisions in there that most of this should still fall on the reinsurers. Correct. And, and our, our analysts have gone out and really done a thorough scrub of all the credits that we own. You know, there's business continuity insurance. There's money that does come in from the government. Uh, we're not anticipating that this will lead to any defaults. And I think uh, any of the rebuilding efforts, I think, would actually be welcome in the municipal market. We've not seen a lot of new issuance come. Mm -hmm. And I think any of that uh, issuance that would come to help rebuild uh, would go in and actually be constructive for our market. And I'm glad Romaine brought up the idea that there are these key bond provisions and insurance coverage that kind of protects bondholders of the Maryland State Transportation Authority. Sure. Is that standard? Is that something that's kind of across the board for these kinds of issuers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you see that as standard in any of uh, municipal issuance, any of these type of large infrastructure projects uh, do have those key provisions in place. So uh, generally, again, uh, our, our thoughts go to the, uh, to the families of this crisis, but uh, we do go in and any of these type of catastrophic events go in and see the insurance come in and kick in. Or if it is not there, certainly uh, FEMA money or federal government money often does come through. Well, thank you for um, giving us your instant analysis, your instant read here sure, to the you. latest developments. I want to get your take overall on investor expectations and how it's changed in the muni world, uh, given what we've seen the last couple of years. We've gotten used to these 5% plus returns in our high yield savings accounts. Sure. How does that affect people's investment preferences, the products they choose, or the expectations they now have when they're looking at products in the muni world? Yeah, I think three things right now, broadly, we're seeing in the muni market. The first is it's just so welcome. Fixed income actually has income for the first time in a very long time. And the muni market went through a very painful period in 2022 and 2023, parts of 23, uh, to get a reset. But, you know, the second thought is now we are in the municipal market and we have the highest level of yields to start a year since 2011. So investors right now are getting paid handsomely to wait for the Fed. So if the Fed cuts rates on June 12th, July 31st, or doesn't cut at all, there's still an expectation for a very good total return profile for munis. Uh, and last, just um, the third point is just right now, if you look at municipals, you look at uh, where an investor in the highest tax bracket is, you know, you can earn five and three quarters percent for a nice double A essential service monopoly portfolio. So we're really seeing a very good yield advantage versus uh, anything in corporates, MBS, ABS, and especially I, I think versus cash and treasury equivalents, which have been yielding uh, a, a decent amount. But uh, municipals right now on a tax equivalent basis are yielding more. And so this gets us to this idea that if you do get that change in interest rates, a right. significant change, at least the significant change the market wants here, does that change? then the appeal or the potential return opportunities. Yeah, ab absolutely. Because okay. all of a sudden then you shift from clipping your coupon and just having income to a capital appreciation event. And the last time that we had the Fed even hint at a potential rate cut was in the fourth quarter of 2023, and we saw an 8% return for the municipal market. So I, I think right now investors could get paid to wait, but if we do have this event where the Fed begins to cut and we have penciled in three cuts for 2024, uh, you all of a sudden have both income and a meaningful capital appreciation event. Dan, always uh, great to talk to you. And, Thank you so uh, appreciate you uh, answering our questions here about the big news of the day surrounding the collapse of that bridge in Baltimore. Dan Close, who heads the municipal's business over at Nuveen. And we do want to stick with that story of the Francis Scott Key Bridge out there in Baltimore and bring into this conversation Kerry Davis, president and CEO of the American Association of Port Authorities. And Kerry, right now, a lot of folks still trying to assess the damage, still trying to assess the loss of life, but a lot of folks also, they need to know, Kerry, how long can we expect the marine terminals out there in Baltimore to be shut down? Thanks so much for the opportunity to come on Bloomberg, one of my favorite channels to 
talk about uh, the importance of ports, uh, U.S. seaports to our supply chains and resilience. Uh, first, I've got to say my heart is heavy and aches uh, for, the, for the loss and uncertainty that we're experiencing right now. Uh, I'm so sorry for those people who were who were on that bridge impacted. And I think the story that's been a little underreported is that the brave mariners who were on that giant vessel uh, did everything possible to call in uh, a mayday and an emergency, uh, and and quite literally uh, put put their put themselves uh, in danger. Fortunately, the the trestles collapsed on a yeah. part of the uh, vessel. Uh, where they were not working to drop anchor and where they were not on the bridge. So it dropped right in between where all those mariners were. And how long this could take, uh, un uncertain uh, U.S. Uh, Coast Guard and dredging and tugboat uh, and emergency response salvage operations are as good as any in the world. Uh -huh. um, this is uh, unprecedented. It's going to take days and weeks before the channel to all of those terminals at the port becomes accessible again. Yeah. Kerry, I am curious, and for those folks who don't really know this industry or understand the process of how these ships coming in and out of the ports, Bloomberg's done a lot of reporting uh, about the signals that the folks on that ship sent to let folks know on the ground something was wrong, whether there was a loss of propulsion or whatever. Was there no tugboats or any other mechanisms out there in place that maybe could have helped to divert this ship? Is that not normal? As best I understand, uh, there weren't any tugs deployed at the time. But what, what you've got to understand is that the pilots who are as experienced as anyone uh, in any conditions uh, and know the uh, these navigable channels like the back of their hands, there was a pilot and a pilot apprentice on board as there always uh, would be in a situation like this. And uh, I, on my limited information and a little bit of speculation, uh, guess that this was a mechanical failure where there was probably no human intervention uh, that could have done anything um, to prevent what happened. I I'm, I'm guessing a little bit there, but I don't exactly know what equipment was deployed at the time. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that. I I'm curious to hear from you, what type of cargo will be impacted the most uh, with things paralyzed at the moment? And to what extent can that cargo uh, be rerouted to other U.S. ports along the East Coast versus uh, going around to the other side of the country? Yeah, cargo, uh, especially containerized cargo, is fungible. Uh, and I always say that cargo flows like water. It's always going to find the path of least resistance. And because of the standardization that goes into containerization, it can definitely, uh, the, the, the vessels can be rerouted and the containers can be offloaded and then reloaded at other locations. But the sorts of containerized cargo, I don't know exactly what was on uh, this vessel, which was making multiple calls along the East Coast, but it could be anything from consumer goods to apparel to perishables, which go in, in refrigerated containers, of course. I know that there was a cargo ship that called on the port, uh, I, I think just yesterday, which had something like uh, 100 mandarin orange uh, refrigerated containers. So th those are the types of cargoes that this vessel was carrying. And yes, they can be rerouted to other ports uh, nearby. When you take a step back, Kerry, and just look at um, the ships that we're using these days, are they perhaps maybe too big to maneuver in older ports um, that have these aging bridges and uh, less space than the ships um, that were originally built to handle? Well, it's a it's a fair question, and it's actually something that the ports and the federal government and policymakers look at all the time. The, the very first thing I'll say is that our industry's work with the regulators and the Coast Guard would never allow an unsafe situation or a previously known unsafe situation to transpire. So we look a lot at the technical aspects of whether a harbor or a land land side infrastructure could accommodate the vessels, and we would never allow a dangerous situation. The second thing I'll say is that it is amazing. And I give huge kudos to federal policymakers for passing recent large-scale generational investment legislation in port infrastructure to help recapitalize what is, as you pointed out, aging infrastructure. 
But the very last thing I'll say here is that if you look at the specifics of, of this facility, it, it probably wasn't um, size or age that, that really uh, led to any of this. The depth of the, of the navigable channel there is 50 feet. Uh, mm. That can accommodate most any, mo most any of the types of modern ships that are calling on U.S. ports. And I also, I was very curious, yeah. I, looked at the, I looked at the air draft of the Key Bridge as well, and it has 100 and, about 185 feet of air draft. So that's the difference between the height yeah. of the water and the bottom of the bridge. And that can accommodate most any modern uh, vessel as well. So yeah. I really don't think this was an aging infrastructure issue. All right, really appreciate you taking time for us, Kerry. I know it's a difficult day. Kerry Davis, he's president and CEO of the AAPA. We're going to stick with this topic here. We heard just a little earlier from one of the two senators from Maryland, Ben Cardin. When we come back, we're going to hear from Senator Chris Van Hollen. That's coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close here in New York. We go back down to Baltimore. Kaylee Lines, the co-host of Balance of Power, standing by right now with Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland. Kaylee. Romaine, thank you so much. Senator Van Hollen is indeed here with me at the scene. We're just behind us. The Key Bridge collapsed very early this morning. Senator, thank you so much for making time for Bloomberg. It has been underscored by many authorities here that this is still an active search and rescue effort. Humans come first. Everything else comes later. But when we think about the ramifications of this bridge now being inoperable, the port not working, commuter traffic being diverted, and knowing you sit on the banking committee. How worried are you about the economic ramifications of what happened today? Well, as you said, first and foremost, our focus is on finding those uh, who were on the bridge and making sure their loved ones know we've turned over every stone uh, to do that. Uh, look, this will have big economic uh, consequences, which is why we want to work very quickly uh, to try to, first of all, get the uh, port reopened. That means clearing the channel under this uh, bridge. Uh, and then, of course, comes the rebuilding of the bridge. But the Port of Baltimore is a very active port, one of the busiest ports in the country, the big biggest for roll-on, roll-off autos. Uh, so we've got to get the channel cleared as fast as possible. Um, a lot of small businesses depend on it. A lot of workers um, at the Port of Baltimore depend on it. $2 million in their wages alone a day. When you say as fast as possible and knowing that it's very hard to put a precise timeline estimate on things, would you imagine this happens in weeks or are we more realistically talking about months here? I cannot put an exact timeline on it. It's, I think the, the harder timeline is how long it will take to b rebuild the entire bridge. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, it will be less time, of course, to clear the channel. But I don't know exactly how long it will be now. I talked to the president today, and I think the country heard him speak um, earlier. Uh, he is devoting every federal resource uh, to addressing this issue. The Army Corps of Engineers is here. The Coast Guard is here. The Navy um, will help look at the, the piers that are deep in the water under the bridge. So every federal resource uh, that's available for this kind of thing is being deployed. And about the federal resources, and the president did indicate he would like the federal government to pay for this reconstruction. Do you have an idea of, of what existing infrastructure money that has already been spent may go to this? Or is all of this going to have to be new supplemental requests that your chamber in the House will have to approve? Well, there are some funds in what's called the Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, this is a fund within the Federal Highway Administration uh, that is there specifically for this kind of emergency. Uh, so once the state... Uh, makes its submission, which I think they're going to do very shortly, uh, some of those funds can begin to be drawn down. Now, for the larger, longer-term uh, costs, yes, uh, we're going to call upon our colleagues in Congress to act as swiftly as they can. And you have confidence they will, given how difficult it has proven to get things across the finish line on Capitol Hill? You know, when you have this kind of national emergency, it does unite people uh, across parties. So I'm very much hoping that people will put politics aside. I I've spoken uh, to the chair of the you know, Environment and Public Works Committee in the Senate, uh, Senator Carper, um, Ben Cardin and I have both spoken to uh, Chuck Schumer and others, and I, I think in the end we'll be able to put together a bipartisan consensus. Well, and, and you mentioned how obviously this is a regional issue that is being felt most immediately here, but could have national implications in terms of the supply chain. You mentioned that autos obviously are a big factor here at the Port of Baltimore, but there's many commodities as well that are exported from here. Is there a, a sector or an industry which you are most worried about being able to adapt to the condition of this port being closed, being able to be rerouted easily? 
I, I don't know of one particular sector, uh, but this is one of the busiest ports uh, on the East Coast. Uh, and, you know, those ships will be looking for other temporary places uh, to go. The, the challenge and the, the necessity uh, for the Port of Baltimore is to make sure that once we clear the channel, we get all those, um, all those ships back. That the livelihood of this area depends on it. And finally, Senator, as we talk about supply chain issues, obviously we are now a few years removed from a pandemic which roiled supply chains globally. Are you more confident in the ability for Maryland, the ability for the U.S. to face this challenge now because of that, or are there still vulnerabilities that haven't quite been addressed yet? Well, I think we made a lot of improvements. I think we have learned from COVID. I mean, we had this huge backlog out of the Port of Los Angeles, uh, and I think from that and other situations at ports, uh, we've improved our supply chain um, mechanisms. I'm sure there's plenty of room for improvement, and and this shock to the system um, will show us where some of those um, you know weaker links are, so that we can we can strengthen them. But the main thing here in Baltimore, when finish the search and rescue operation. Um, look for the, the, the loved ones of families, um, and then address the, the issue of, the, of the, the, the channel, because there are lots of other families uh, whose livelihood depends on that, that work. All right, we will leave it on that note. Senator Chris Van Hollen, the Democrat from Maryland, thank you thank so you. much for giving Bloomberg TV your time. And Scarlett, we'll send it back to you. All right, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Kelly Lines, co-host of Balance of Power. Let's pivot back now to corporate news. Uh, Romain, you've got something for us with a timely anniversary. That's right. We just got GameStop earnings. The shares down in after hours trading. So what better reason than to look back in history? Three years ago this week, it actually marked the beginning of the end of the GameStop bubble. Yeah. It was a euphoria cultivated on internet message boards. It lifted a dormant microcap stock and really turned it into the talk of the town. We all know that story. Chewy co-founder Ryan Cohen joining the board, eventually taking control of the company. You had names like uh, Chamath Palahapatia, the venture capitalist, bragging about buying calls in the company. Elon Musk reposting GameStop memes from Reddit's Wall Street Bets forum. High-profile endorsements, along, of course, with that roaring kitty making the fundamental case from his basement. It was rocket fuel for the stock. A 12,000% surge over 10 months from 70 cents a share to 87 bucks by the start of 2021. And at one point, you had a money losing legacy retail business nursing an almost 50% multi year drop in revenue that all of a sudden found itself with a market valuation larger than a tenth of the stocks in the SP 500. The peak market cap, $24 billion at the close on January 27, 2021. But by mid March of that year, the bubble did begin to deflate. Three years ago yesterday, GameStop reported a drop in profitability and a 12th consecutive quarter of slowing sales and decided not to take questions on the conference call. The shares, they plunged 34 percent. And then a day later, well, they rallied 53 percent. It was indicative of the extreme volatility commonplace for the stock. Realized volatility averaging about 400 percent at the time, more than every other stock in the Russell 2000. And that includes other meme favorites like AMC, like Express and Cassava. It was dumb money's moment in the sun, a story made for Hollywood. Now, we don't talk as much about GameStop anymore or AMC or The Nine or Zometica. But has the meme stock rally really faded or did it simply rotate? Take Sweetgreen. It's doubled its price in the past month. Weight loss pill developer Viking Therapeutics has quadrupled since late January. And Supermicro, a once obscure computer server maker, 1,200 percent higher in little over a year. And today brought us a new meme stock with DJT climbing 59% in its first session. And last week, Reddit, the launch pad for the retail investor frenzy, itself went public and is now trading at double its IPO price. Now, it's hard to say if this is the genesis of a new frenzy, but for what it's worth, the Selective Roundhill meme stock index, which includes favorites like MicroStrategy, Kava, Soundhound, and Celsius, has returned 28% over the past two months alone. That's more than quintuple the gains of the NASDAQ 100. Yeah, I think you've made the case that meme stocks uh, are back, certainly just in kind of a different form. For more on GameStop, Reddit, and the meme stocks overall, let's bring in Bloomberg's Bailey Lipschultz. And Bailey, we talked about GameStop reporting earnings, and usually when I say earnings, I put little quote marks around it because um, it's been reporting losses, as Romain has told us, on a quarterly basis. However, the fourth quarter was a different story, and the full year for this past year was also a different story. Profitability, Scarlett. You close stores, you sell games, and seemingly Ryan Cohen can eke out six cents on a 
fully uh, diluted basis, adjusted basis for the 53 weeks ending in February. Romain, yes. what, what do you make of that? I, well, what do I make of it is, well, sales were down <laughs> by double-digit percentages. Even like the little, what do they call it? The, the business that sells those bobbleheads? Uh, the oh, the accessories. Funkos? Yeah, it was down like 20 or 30%. Yeah. What's going on, man? Oh, yeah, they, they, yeah. Well, it, well, it's tough to re- compare it to estimates, right? There are only really two analysts that actually Are there estimates? The <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> estimates in quotes, maybe. But as you mentioned, the sales are down. That's why you're seeing shares down about 15%. Just want to call out, though, this stock has rallied the last two days. This is an options play because it is a retail trader favorite. Options were implying a 23% potential one day swing. I'm not going to close my eyes and be shocked though if the stock opens in the green tomorrow simply because there really are no rules with this company. There are no rules with this company. All right. Bailey Lipschultz, thank you so much. That's a good way to to segue into our next conversation because our next guest says the meme stocks phenomenon is here to stay. Joining us now is Matthew Tuttle. He is CEO and CIO of Tuttle Capital Management. Matt, great to speak with you. Thanks for joining us. Um, GameStop, the whole phenomenon, is that over or does it kind of live on in dribs and drabs? So it's not over at all and it lives on very powerfully. I mean, you just mentioned it, you know, True Social was the stock today. They have moved on from GameStop to an extent, but GameStop's become kind of a comp where if some other meme stocks are rallying, if someone missed something else, they're going to jump into a GameStop or an AMC. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be the main name anymore, but it's still it's still in play. It's still in play. So, you know, here at Bloomberg, we like to dig into the corporate earnings and give you all the, the uh, get granular and give you all the details. I'm looking at their earnings release. There are nine bullet points on here, and they also have said they're not going to be holding a conference call. They did give some details in their 10K filing to regulators saying that they've um, changed uh, their investment policy to a committee structure. Doesn't that kind of go against the idea of a GameStop that is basically catering to individual investors who want information? So not in this case and not with a meme stock. I mean, you you guys said it. That that stuff doesn't matter to the people trading it. All that matters is... To Warren Kitty, it matters, though. Well, but to a lot of the really, the, the smart people out there who are on Twitter, who are in the discords, who know how to move this stuff, they're looking for high short interest, and they're looking for options that they can juice up. And, you know, they're just looking for something to move. They yeah. move it for a day or two, and then they move on. But one thing that's interesting about the latest, I guess, iteration of the meme stock trade here, you don't necessarily have the same emotion that I think we saw with GameStop. Because so much what drove that stock, was there was a lot of animosity against Melvin Capital and Ken Griffin, whether he was even involved in it, who knows. But they all hated him as a, as a result and felt like they had to push the stock up. And that was a huge groundswell for, for that, for AMC and for a couple other stocks back then. Do we not have that same type of uh, emotion? You don't. Yeah. And, and I saw it. I made the mistake yeah. of tweeting something about AMC once years ago, and I just got savage. <laughs> uh, and have My never done it. Yeah. yeah, never done it <laughs> since. But yeah. no, I mean, now what you've seen, what GameStop and AMC did mm. is it showed the smarter retail traders how to do it. Yeah. And for them, it, there's no emotion. It's just what, what's yeah. today's play? Yeah. Oh, all right, it's it's uh, Truth Social today. Yeah. Everyone's jumping on it. Well, well, that's. I wonder if we kind of, when we use the word meme stock, we always kind of almost use it in a derisive matter. And we forget. I mean, she mentions Rory and Kidding, Kitty, but we kind of forget. I mean, he was basically doing bottom up fundamental analysis, and he was the one who looked at that stock and said, look, there's something there. Uh, and long term, maybe it's not there, but certainly in the moment, he tapped into something that the institutional investors either didn't see or just didn't want to see. Well, the institutions yeah. are still stuck in the old fundamental analysis. Yeah. And as long as they are, that allows the retail guys to take advantage. Mm-hmm. You know, was Melvin Capital right to short this stuff? Yeah, they probably were. Mm-hmm. They're not, not here anymore. Yeah. And, you know, the retail guys are taking advantage of the people who look and say, this is a short. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe back 20 years ago it was a short. Today, mm. it's going to get juiced up and you're going to lose a lot of money. Who's, who's on the brave short enough side. to really get in front of that, though? I mean, there's, there was all this talk about DJT and how it's a perfect short. Mm-hmm. Then you look at the, the, the premiums on that and you're like, you'd be insane to short that. Yeah, well, I but mean. Pe- people were shorting it. Yeah. Well, or you don't have to short it. You could just uh, do it through options, right? I mean, why, why go down that path? complicated path. So talk a little bit about the IPO market because Reddit, of course, went public earlier this year. And then you have DJT making its trading debut, not uh, by the traditional listing, but through a blank check company merger. Um, What does that say about the 
companies that are looking to maybe list on the stock exchange and you know maybe ride this wave of retail investor interest? So I think what happened with Reddit and, and some of the other IPOs and, and DJT, hopefully DJT brings SPACs back. That would be a lot of fun. The retail guys would love that. And we run a SPAC fund, so I'd love to see it. <laughs> but what, what that shows is companies that are looking maybe IPOs are back because everything has pretty much come back to the way it was before COVID, except for the IPOs. So hopefully that starts the IPO engine going and I think that'd be great yeah. for everything. But you need to see a little bit more strength in that secondary market. We've had some decent IPOs come out of the gate, but then we've seen over the days and weeks following, you just don't have the same investor appetite. Right, and, and yeah. you also, I mean, you need some good companies. Yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of these have come out and certainly the, you know, the right. SPAC ones, you know, those all go down to one eventually. Yeah. Well, well, like, I mean, something like DJT, I mean, look, we're talking about a company that I think last time I checked out like four million in like annual revenue. So that's, let's just set that to the side. And obviously we know Donald Trump, that's a whole juggernaut on his own. Yeah. But take something like Supermicro, which makes real things, has real sales, uh, and has seen this massive pop. I don't know if it's justified 1,200%, but isn't that something that it's meme but there's also fundamental, a fundamental nature to it. It's meme there's a fundamental nature, and even more important, there's an AI nature. Yeah. And anything AI you know, non-NVIDIA, because, you know, NVIDIA could keep going and going and going, but you're probably not going to get a super micro move out of a NVIDIA. No. So the retail guys are now looking, where right, what, what's the next level? Mm. And super micro is it, you know, ARM, there's some other names that they're looking yeah. at as well. What's the newest meme stock name? I mean, aside from DJT, which went public today, or which began trading today? So... You know, you've named most of them here. I think ARM has some potential. Huh. You know, I'm in a lot of different discords and they're, they're talking a lot about ARM. Uh, so that one definitely has some potential. I'm hearing a lot on the options. Uh -huh. We might look at that to do a single stock ETF on. So that, I mean, if I had to say one that you didn't already mention, that could be the next. All right, Matthew Tuttle of Tuttle Capital Management. Thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate it. All right, um, when you look at markets today, Romano was kind of a big yawn. We did kind of sink towards the close, and when I say sink, it's in quote marks because we closed down three tenths of one percent after doing not much of anything yeah. for most of the trading session, um, and not a whole lot going on in the treasury space either, e even with uh, a sixty-seven billion dollar auction of five-year notes. Yeah, not a whole lot going on. A couple economic data points, and other than that, you're basically in a holiday shortened week. Yep. So, and again, I, you know, I always like to point out when you get to the end of a end of a month end of a quarter, I should say, like this, so we're two days away from the end of the quarter, the price action really starts to get distorted. Not, yeah. not necessarily a reflection of how people feel, just a matter of what they need to position for uh, for the end of the quarter. All that quarter-end yeah. positioning with yeah. equities up about 10% by the uh, with the S&P 500 uh, so far this year. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, welcome back to the close. 449 here in the U.S., about 449 a.m. over in Beijing, where some U.S. executives will be sticking around the country for a little bit longer. We are learning that they have received invitations to a dinner on Wednesday to meet with a top Chinese leader that is widely expected to be President Xi Jinping. Enda Curran joining us right now from our Bloomberg uh, Bureau uh, down there. Uh, Enda, uh, what do we know here about this potential meeting? We know the executives are there. We've seen all the footage here. And now we've got this cryptic story that they've got a dinner set up with a top official. Yeah, our colleagues in Beijing are reporting that the, uh, some executives are going to wait back for an extra day to meet with the unnamed official, like you mentioned. But the template for this actually is that it was a similar process at San Francisco during the APEC meetings when President Xi met business leaders. It was kind of a bit of a, a, a coded invite to executives to get together to hear from China's top leader. And it looks like 
that's what's going to happen here uh, later uh, on Wednesday in Beijing also. We don't know which executives will be attending it, but we do know some CEOs of some of the biggest US companies have been there for talks. But by all accounts, the bottom line is this will be an opportunity for China to repeat the message that it is open for business and that it welcomes foreign investment. Okay, so given that um, we've seen some of these CEOs meet with Chinese officials back in November when uh, Xi Jinping was uh, in the U.S., does that suggest that there's been kind of a a steady um, engagement between the Chinese government and U.S. uh, CEOs this whole time that kind of is culminating into this potential meeting on Wednesday? Well, there's certainly been a consistent message from Beijing that they want foreign investment, Scarlett. They want foreign know-how and technology. And they're, you know, they're preaching this message that they're clearing the hurdles, making it easier for foreign business to operate there. And we saw that move, for example, on data transfers recently. Obviously, though, corporate sentiment remains quite fragile. It hasn't yet recovered from the COVID zero days. There is plenty of criticism around the opacity of the Chinese government and the various policy measures they've taken in, term, in terms of the reluctance to get the economy going again, for example. So it feels more like outreach from the Chinese side rather than, you know, U.S. CEOs or global MNC CEOs being convinced that China is turning a corner. But nonetheless, it, yes, it's another example of both sides coming together and it's not too long ago when even that wasn't happening. Okay, that's interesting. I didn't realize it was more of an outreach by China rather than the other way around. What Can you compare and contrast that with uh, Beijing's relationship with uh, company leaders from other parts of the world, for instance, from Europe or from Africa? Well, with Europe, China has been, I'd say, explicitly courting Europe. You've seen some analysts make the point, of course, that China has been trying to play Europe off against the US. So there has been a concerted separate kind of effort there. Same is probably broadly true of what analysts refer to as the global south. China, of course, has been courting business in that part of the world, too. The, the, you know, the deep freeze has been on the US-China side. And you know, the, um, the finance and the banking and the corporate world has been one channel that has been kept open to some degree, even as both governments stop talking to each other. And I think this meeting on Wednesday, providing it goes ahead, is just another example of how both sides are kind of on timeout in terms of the tensions between the two economies. But regardless of what comes out of this meeting, it's probably not going to change the bigger picture of the uh, geopolitical tensions between both governments. Yeah, certainly so. Certainly not in the short term, but a long game by some of these CEOs. And uh, great to catch up with you, Enda Curran, in our Washington, D.C. Bureau, keeping an eye here. Those U.S. CEOs uh, set to meet based on Bloomberg reporting with President Xi Jinping at some point later in the day. We're also going to set you up for some of the other big market moving events over the next 24 hours. That coming up after the break on Bloomberg. Market catalyst this week, a bit limited, but we do get some earnings tomorrow, Scarlett, including out of RH. Yeah, RH, uh, Restoration Hardware, of course, Carnival Cruise Lines, Land's End, mm, so certainly yeah. a read on the consumer. Absolutely. We also get, well, some central bank decisions. Yeah, Sweden's central bank expected to keep its rate at 4%, but may lay the groundwork for a cut before the end of June. And then back here in the U.S., Fed Governor Christopher Waller scheduled to speak. I feel like he's the one that we need to start paying attention to. Really? Yeah, among the Fed policymakers. Tell me more work. after the break, but stick around. Balance of Power is coming up next. Scarlett and I will be back tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.